Lifting to failure is too much intensity most of the time for most people, unless you program it right, and then it's pretty awesome. So glad <laughs> that we we finally did this for everybody yeah. because the truth is I know that each of us use this technique um, within our own programming, uh, but I also think that it's something that we rarely use it compared to how we used to use it all the time. And I think the reason why that's been our messaging since the beginning that you can get in the best shape of your life and never train to failure. Uh, we intentionally set out to help people uh, move in that direction because we knew that they would get more benefit from it. But that doesn't mean that there isn't value in utilizing it, but how you use it is so important. That's we it, can still get after it, man. Yeah, well, that's it. So the problem was, wasn't that there wasn't any value in it. The problem was that it caused people to plateau so hard um, and because it, it does produce very rapid gains, but then you plateau so hard um, that actually takes weeks to to reverse out of it or it can cause injury. And so the issue was it just never was programmed right. Every yeah. program that include failure training, they couldn't solve that problem. How do we get the maximum benefits? How do we minimize uh, the negatives? Um, and so for the last, I don't know, a decade since we had Mind Pump, this was something that all of us have really tried to figure out. Because otherwise it was kind of by feel, right? Like mm -hmm. you know your body, your experience, or you're training a client. You could see their progress. You know when you throw it in. But like, how do you program it so that it's scheduled besides telling people, if you feel good, throw in some sets to failure because you know that'll lead to just people overdoing it or underdoing it. Yeah. And um, and that's with MAPS Anabolic Advance, that's what we kind of figured out is here's how you program failure. And it it seems to work well, very well, and avoid those plateaus when you alternate it every other week with volume training, which isn't to failure, and you throw in some deload weeks and a few other things. Then it's like, it's amazing. Well, that's always been the challenge for us is to come up with these sort of general guidelines and parameters uh, because of all those individual variances all mm -hmm. over the place to consider, you know, like there's always going to be somebody that uh, benefits tremendously from maybe going a little bit further along and more excessive or somebody that's, you know, way less. Uh, but but in terms of like your everyday average person, that's our avatar. That's our person that we're trying to kind of steer. And so to be able to create a more intensified program, um, we had to really kind of consider, you know, how, how do we like, how do we make this appropriate for them? Yeah, it, it's, a, it's an incredible technique that has just been abused for uh, several decades now. And I think a, a lot of the reason behind that, like, the science came out and it's been out for a long time now and the benefits of it. And then you had uh, the, I don't know, the over glorification of it with yeah. bodybuilders making these intense hype videos that I'm 100% guilty of, you know, falling into and, and loving to watch before I go lift. And then I go in with that mentality almost every workout and seeing some initial results and then and then getting that confirmation bias that oh this is this is the shit this does work and then becoming that kid who goes in the gym and lifts that way every exercise every set every time i train and then there's the other part of that where we start to attach soreness to effective workouts thinking that oh the mm -hmm. more sore i got the the more potential results i have not realizing uh, how much I was overdoing. Yeah. And in fact, that's probably the reason why I stayed in a, or hit a, a hard plateau for so long. Yeah. One of the biggest uh, detriments or, I don't know, issues I have with our space is that people, they they divide themselves into camps and you'll often have people who are like, oh, it's about low volume, high intensity training. That's the way to train. It's like, no, 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 no. Drop the volume a little bit. It's, uh, excuse me, drop the intensity a little bit. It's super high volume, right? This debate has been happening for decades, by the way. I remember in the 70s, it was like the Arnold camp versus like the Mike Menser camp. In the 90s, you had Dorian Yates, who was the high intensity, low volume guy. And then you had other bodybuilders who were like, like Lee Priest, who was like high volume, lower intensity. That's the way to go. The, the, really, what's funny about it is it's, you got to look at all these things like tools. And all these tools are valuable if they're used right. 
So like if you work in construction, you can look at a hammer and be like, oh my God, this, this is, this is the tool. I can do everything with it. No, you can't. You can do some great stuff with it, but other things, it doesn't work so well. Other things you need other tools. So you want to look at all these different techniques that all have been shown to have value either through studies or anecdotes and experience and then say, okay, here's the best, here are the tools. What's it good for? What, what's it not good for? How do I program this properly so I can maximize its benefits and minimize its potential negatives? And when it comes to failure training, nobody did that. Yeah. No, if, if you followed programs that incorporated failure, the entire program incorporated failure. It was all low volume, high intensity. You never saw them utilize different aspects of training, put them together in a way to where they complement each other, where one helps with the recovery from the other one and uh, the other one sends a signal that builds muscle well, I, throughout the whole process. So by, incorpor- by by putting them together the right way, you actually maximize all of their benefits. Nobody does it. It's always camp. It's always yeah, camp. There was different. a point I felt like it was almost competitive for people to come up with the craziest uh, experience, the craziest workout yeah. program and they could possibly make you go through and, and who like demoralized that person the most. And, and it was like uh, a lot of like coaches, I would just look at the the volume and the intensity and it was insane. It was like, you know, what benefit was the, the person going through that actually receiving other than just getting punished? It's funny. If you look at like the muscle building space um, and you go, I mean, you can go all the way back to the 1920s. Here was the here's how it kind of morphed, right? It went from full body, three day a week routines. Then that turned into somewhat kind of body part splits. Then it turned into double split, high volume routines where bodybuilders would uh, they would brag about how long the workouts were. I'm in the gym for two and a half hours twice a day. That was Arnold's era. Then you had bodybuilders like I only work out for 20 minutes, but I go to failure, forced reps, forced negatives. This was Mike Menser and his followers. I remember in the 90s, this debate happened again because then the volume crowd climbed up, right, with Lee Haney and all those bodybuilders of the 80s. And then again, you had uh, Dorian Yates come out. He wins Mr. Olympia. And he goes, no, 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 I only do like six, like five sets or six sets to failure per body part. And of course, everybody followed him because he was Mr. Olympia. Um, There's value in all these things. And it's not one or the other. It's not like if you train one way, you can't incorporate the other one. You can... You just got to know how to kind of piece them together because you can't do all of them at once, right? You can't do high volume and failure and high frequency because you'll you'll kill yourself. So the key is look at all of them, see how they work. How do I pl- plug these pieces in so that they fit? And this was the puzzle that we, look, you know, we started Mind Pump eight years ago. Uh, Maps Anabolic, the first program was created 10 years ago. Over that whole period of time, this was something that all of us through interviewing people, strength, experts and coaches and trainers and bodybuilders and experimenting like we figured this out that's you know we put it in the program and we're still in the launch phase i think right doug so people could still get it with the, yes you know, perfect a few but, more days. but we're already getting feedback and people are like oh my god this is so it'll be fun to see the experience that people get from yeah this. because yeah. you know it's failure is pretty cool right because there's studies on like i remember before these studies came out People were like, oh, high reps don't build muscle. If you do like 25, 30 reps, you're not going to build muscle. Then the studies came out and said, actually, if you do 30 reps to failure, it builds just as much muscle as 10 reps does because it goes because it's to failure. And then those studies came out. Then there were studies that showed that, uh, oh, um, failure training works great, but the volume training works great longer because the failure training plateaus so hard. However, the failure training produces faster results when it does produce results. You got to take all these into consideration plug them in and then boom, you get, you know, phenomenal results. And what's cool about it, you mentioned soreness. The soreness you get from training to failure, low volume is different than the high volume, lower intensity training. The soreness from the failure training happens a little later. What is that? I don't know. I don't know. It's really weird though. It is very strange. It, like, you know, it reminds me of us trying to explain to the difference of like the way your muscle looks when you lift heavy weights versus yes, when you do, it's yeah. like the versus the kind of like you know, hypertrophy pump look that bodies have. It's like still haven't found the words to explain that. I just know I've been doing it long enough. I've seen it on enough bodies, including myself mm-hmm. to know it exists, but can't put words to what it is. No. So there's something there also with the type of soreness that you get based off of the type of lift that you're getting. Some you, with the mechanical stress for sure. I do was, you, 
Do you uh, think it's that, or do you think that can we actually feel potentially a difference well, in, in fast twitch versus slow twitch fibers? Think, or you think you think it's something like it's that? It's the oh, fluid, I think, too, of being able to move out the cells and to, to actively help kind of with the recovery and facilitate that. Uh, you know, with with that type of uh, training versus like you know, you're more like heavy loaded mechanical stress that you're, you're facing. Yeah, I mean, we're speculating because uh, there hasn't been really good studies on this, but. The fatigue you feel is different too. Well, when I would do the higher volume training, the because like with with anabolic advanced, uh, I mean this is part of the program. There's a lot more to it, but you alternate high volume, low volume, uh, lower intensity, higher intensity, and then there's more to it. But the fatigue after the high volume training feels more I don't know muscular, mm -hmm. whereas the fatigue after the failure training feels more central nervous system. Like because the failure training workouts were only like right. they they'd be like 25 minutes, 30 minutes, right? Because it's low volume. But I mean, when Doug and I were first experimenting and both of us would look at each other and be like, dude, I, I it was 20 minutes, but I feel like, man, I really taxed the shit out of me, but my muscles don't feel taxed. It's my CNS feels taxed. Yeah. Then you do the volume training. So it's really interesting, the difference in how it feels on the body. So it's got to be sending yeah. a signal that's different. Right? I was listening to, was it Dr. Andy Galpin and, and on Huberman and they're kind of breaking down like delayed onset um, soreness and, and how he speculated that, um, like, you know, we thought it was like micro tears and like the, yeah. the rebuilding process and all that. And then he said, yeah, that's probably partially part of it. But the majority of it, he thinks, is is more of this like um, sort of like an, an immune response uh, oh, yeah. to stress. And so like the, yeah, it makes sense. Oh, yeah the amount of inflammation that you produce um, is, you know, it's individualized, but you're going to get more of a reactive response, um, you know, from your immune system more so than just like, you know, the rebuilding process. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense actually. Yeah. That's interesting. It is interesting because uh, soreness is such a poor indicator. It's interesting to observe, but it doesn't really tell you. It's like the whole pain, you know, like perception, right? Yeah. Like how that varies so much. Yeah. Cause you could, you could, I mean, if you know your body well and you have good programming, you will sometimes train a sore muscle. And I used to think you couldn't. I used to think, uh -huh, don't train yeah. a sore muscle. That's the worst thing you could possibly do. Leave it alone. It's like the best thing, yeah. And then I learned later on, like training a sore muscle sometimes, uh, like amplifies. Yeah, but growth how you do it is so yeah, important. How you That's do it. Because yeah. that was the mistake that I made yep. was thinking that, like, oh, then I'll just I'll just train through the soreness, and beat the crap out of but it. But then I'm still pushing to that same level of intensity when when you are training to facilitate recovery, the mindset is completely different. It's almost yeah. like they're totally different work. I mean, even if you're doing the same exercises the approach is like it's completely different yep. and you have to be able to make that switch which is difficult to do because you get into this this like way of training and you you kind of marry that what that philosophy and then no matter what day you're training you try and ap approach the lifts like that where you have to be able to weave in and out of it if you're really trying to maximize uh your results yeah speaking to that um it's better to program to have structure to your programming and to weave in and out before you hit the plateau. Because what people tend to do is they tend to, smart people tend to do this. Dumb people tend to do something different. So dumb people just keep going through, they're plateauing, then they start to hurt, then they overtrain, they just keep pushing. Smart people wait till they plateau and then they switch. Really smart people program so the plateaus don't happen. Yeah. So you, you don't, yeah, you, you're ahead of it. So you switch up the programming before you see a plateau and you end up avoiding those plateaus or making the plateau happen much later. So you get much well, one of the, progress. one of the things that you've said on the podcast many times that I love, and I think it's a great way to explain it is that what you can tolerate is not necessarily what is optimal. Right. And I think we mistake that a lot, like, and including myself, like I do something and I'm like, Oh, I can handle that. So therefore you do more yeah. or you continue to do that yeah. when just because you can handle it, it doesn't necessarily mean this is what's going to give you the best results. So by like just how we move our phases, right? You technically could get away with four to six weeks of training in a particular phase, but we move you out of that phase at three or four most in most MAPS programs to try and stay ahead of that. Instead of waiting like, oh, I could still go to six and then you feel the breakdown or you feel the plateau yeah. and then transitioning. It's like, stay ahead of it, keep the body transitioning, but still give it enough time to where it can yes. uh, get the benefits. From yes, it. exactly. What's up, everybody? We're going to give away the new MAPS Anabolic Advanced Program again because we're still in the launch period. So here's how you can win free access to MAPS Anabolic Advanced. Leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop this video. Also, subscribe to this channel, turn on notifications, 
And then we'll look through the comments. If we pick you as the winner, we'll let you know in the comment section. Also, uh, again, it's on sale because it's a launch. There's three days left for this sale. So instead of paying retail, which will be $157, you only pay $97 plus. We're going to throw in two free eBooks, Advanced Train Techniques, and the Carb Cycling Diet. So sign up now or within the next three days, get the discounted price plus the two free eBooks. If you're interested, go to anabolicadvance.com and then use the code AA60 for the discount and the free books. All right, here comes the show. All right, speaking of stress and stuff, I got to tell you guys about this weekend. So this weekend I had uh, <laughs> my, my, Segue. my niece and nephew uh, visit uh, from Vegas. So these are this is Jessica's niece and nephew. Great time, right? So they're both teenagers. So I had my, my teens, I had them, and then we had the toddler and the infant. And Jessica is, you know, excited. So she's like, let's all, let's, let's plan a day. We'll, we'll go up to Monterey Bay Aquarium with everybody. And mm -hmm. the teenagers will drive up, drive up on their own since we'll have the little ones. I was going to say, thing. do you have to rent a bus when you go with a, no, a we got the Suburban. <laughs> we could all fit. I know. <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> I got so many little yeah. mini buses. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, like, I'm, you know, I'm game. Let's give this a shot and see what happens. So, I mean, so we go up, first of all, there was traffic on the way there. Cause everybody had this, I guess, idea. So it's an hour and a half in the car with a toddler and an infant, right? She's, uh, Dahlia's not even three months. And we're driving up. And so Aurelius, we're like, he'll try, he'll nap in the car. No, he didn't nap in the car. So he missed a nap. Dahlia, did, she refused to sleep as well. So I'm like, oh, this is going to be, it's going to oh, be awesome. That's good. We get there and it's super packed and it just turned into meltdowns. Like, yeah. Meltdown oh after meltdown. <laughs> oh and Jessica and I are trying to manage uh, the little ones. Meanwhile, the teen the teens, my son driving, he gets up there right after us because we told them to lag because we knew we might have to pull over or something, right? <laughs> they pull up to the parking lot. Parking lot's full. So now they're driving around trying to find parking. They drove around for an hour and a half trying to find parking. Are you no, kidding they, me? No, Did swear to God. An hour and a half? Yeah. Trying to find parking because it was apparently one of the busiest- President's weekend, I guess. Yeah, yeah. weekends of the year. <laughs> so so there, I'm on the phone with them, right? <laughs> I hear my daughter yelling at my son because oh she's got to go pee and he won't pull over. Oh my God, dude. I'm managing, you know, Aurelius is losing his uh, shit, like losing his mind. Yeah. Dahlia's crying. So Jessica's like, at, at one point, Jessica's like, I don't give a shit if people look. I'm pulling my boob out and I'm going to nurse yeah. her in front of everybody. I'm like, you do your thing, babe. I don't give a shit. <laughs> 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 so she, she's like walking around with trying to nurse the baby, you know, and it's just, we couldn't really see anything because we're trying to walk around. We got two strollers. Aurelius wants me to hold oh them. Oh my God. I'm trying to push the stroll at the same time. Oh, and then just like sees of people on top of Bro, all this, right? Like, just, yeah, it was around. just crazy. We ended up staying. Uh, we stayed for 30 minutes. <laughs> We stayed for 30, 40 minutes. Bro, I should have stayed in Vegas. Like, I went to Mandalay Bay, Dude. and I, honestly, I had a better experience at their aquarium than I do, like, the Monterey Bay one. Dude, Dude it was... it's sick. Have you ever been there? No. Yeah, I have. And Monterey's- Is it bigger than Monterey's? Oh, it's not yeah. big. It's, like, better. Like, it's just better. It's yeah. well designed. Yeah. Let's put it that way. Because Monterey's a great aquarium. Monterey, and, and the thing about Monterey is it has everything specific to the Monterey Bay. Like, yeah, yeah. And so this had, like, uh, some cool, like, Kimono Dragon. Oh, had, wow. like, you know- uh, uh, had this really cool viewing where it was like a sunken ship. They built this like almost like sunken pirate ship. So you could view out and see this huge shark tank. And then they would swim right over your head oh, wow. and everything. And yeah. it's just like Vegas. They think of all these things of like how to like make it a little no, more entertaining. No, no, dude, we did, we could barely stay. We didn't even meet up with the teenagers. They finally parked. I'm like, bro, you're go. crazy yeah. that you do that. That's you were the insane. one too that planned to think. I can't remember what it was. I remember I opted out though. You guys did. You all did something for one of the holidays. Like you wanted to go somewhere publicly and like, uh, I'm like I'm so if it's a holiday like yeah, yeah, the, where I the crowds going, are I'm yeah, like over here yeah like yeah. I'm, I'm not going to like the most popular place to go for 4th of July or New Year's or things like that I'm just not a fan of that like Dude, I'll, I'll go on an off you should have seen us on the way back too because we're oh, trying to man. get back to the car and there's just kids <laughs> babies are, cr are screaming oh my and God. Dahlia now wants to be held so we're trying to push the strollers and Poor I had Jessica. To, she's like, oh, finally, we're going to get out and do something. No, and then dude. it's like, and then, and down so city. who's quicker to lose their shit in a situation than that, you or her? Oh, um, good question. Um, <laughs> boy. Let me think how to answer that. No, <laughs> not, you know what? I mean, both of us, because it's pretty, uh, God, it's, it's, it's give or take. She, I mean, that's hundred percent me. Cause Katrina, I'm, I'm, I will lose my shit way quick. She oh. knows I don't even like going to the mall. She's like, it, she's, she's so good about it. She'll know like if she sees like, so that, and we're with someone like that, she'll be like, 
like, hey, we got to get out of here pretty soon. Yeah. And she'll be, <laughs> Adam's going to have be a like, what? tantrum. Like, she's like, my husband yeah. my husband will be a pain in the ass in about 15 more minutes oh, if we dude. don't get out of here. I had, good like that I had, to, kids I had to bribe him, uh, Aurelius, with candy on the way back, which I knew was going to just make things worse. And, you know? So, oh, bro. It was <sighs> such a nightmare. Oh, it's so terrible. And then the day after, so I So is had, it you or her? So is it you or her who's most likely to, to, to lose their shit? You know what? We almost got out of that. It's balanced. I'm not going to let him. Well, no, no. It's balanced. If one of us loses it, the other one doesn't fuel the fire so the other one kind of calms down and then if i like start losing my shit then jessica's like you know he hasn't had a nap and you know poor kid or whatever and then she calmed me down so we actually did okay dude i was proud i was proud you know what i told jessica i said this is a win she's like how do you mean because <laughs> we didn't fight yes that's yeah that's a, i said because we didn't if, kill that's how i if we, when you're totally. a parent if the kid and all the other uncontrollable things in your life are a, a shit show and you guys don't kill each other it's a win no matter how shitty it went yes if we didn't kill each other over that situation, then it's considered a Dude. win. I and then like. I had, and then the day after, yeah. I took all the teenagers to the mall. First of all, teenagers are like in a perpetual state of meh. That's just their, <laughs> that's just yeah. their attitude, bro. They're just <sighs> yeah, eh. like they wake up in the morning, and you know, Jessica's like, let's play a board game with them, or you know, let them have fun because they're just all sitting on the couch. Like, uh, I'm like fucking don't like walk around and slap everybody. So I'm like trying to have fun with them. I'm like, hey guys, let's go to the mall. I'll take you guys shopping. I think they're gonna get excited. I'll buy you guys stuff. No, nobody's excited. <laughs> it's like I'll bribe you. Everybody just like eh, the whole time. Uh, hey, do you guys want to go in that store? I don't yeah. know. Uh, I don't know if I want to go in that store. I'm like, wow, you guys, you guys need to wait. Do you up. think okay, so is that a teenage thing? Or do you think that's like the generation now just is it both i think yeah it's both it's both i, I see i see uh, ethan kind of falling into that right now yeah, yeah i've just like want, we're trying to hype something up and like get all excited but he's just like, eh. you just rather just sit there it, like, yeah <laughs> he doesn't even have his phone anymore as i took it away for the last like week and a half and he's just like just i'm just gonna sit here yeah I, that, that has to be like <laughs> what okay, that, that has to be like the, the teenagers passive aggressive way of basically telling you like F they, off, they gain I control don't that here. way yeah because i think I, i'm trying I to think that they're i'm trying just, to remember when when i was that age like you're just not impressed when you're a teenager like you know it's like, like that or, i think you're just so you're you're not into anything your parents are into. Even if your parents were into goon something cool, or even yeah. if you would like like playing board games with my friends would be like fun. But if my parents wanted to play board games with me, I'd be meh. Yeah. Right. So I think that's what it is. I think it's just like you yeah, reach that age, cool. you go from your kids thinking you're the world and you're amazing and they, they, yeah. they you know you're su super dad. I want to do everything with you. And then they transition to this. I don't want to do anything with you. And no matter even if you are doing something cool, it's not cool because you're doing it. Maybe right. Yeah, that I has to. Be. So. What do you think, Doug? You, you yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. yeah. So if it has to do anything with the parent, then yeah, not it's exciting. Not cool. Yeah, I, I want to go to movies with my friends. Okay, let's go to the movies. No, yeah. no, yeah. I don't yeah. want to. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. Not that you want to go. No, you. <laughs> no, the little shit. Yeah. But yeah, so there was just it was like, and then and then you know her, his niece and her niece and nephew I, I go to pick him up because i flew to vegas to pick him up and uh they'll make comments like oh you know uh famous uncle sal because of youtube and all that stuff I'm like <laughs> oh guys uncle you know sal. don't say that's so dumb sal. bro i got recognized four times in front of them you did yeah oh, vegas. Wow. No, in vegas here in san jose monterey like different places right like at the mall like four separate times oh, wow. right so i'm like oh cool i'm gonna be even cooler in front of them right <laughs> no i'm not <laughs> I'm not. Then, then, then my niece is like, she's like, you think you're so cool? I'm oh, like, that's what? the worst. Oh, that's the worst. <laughs> oh wow, oh, man. You're letting all that get to your head. Yes, yeah. exactly. Like, like, I'm not letting like, anything happen. It just I'm like, happens. I told her, I'm like, you know, you know, I'm cool. You're just saying that to me. She's like, yeah. no, you're not. Yeah. I'll, I'll downplaying it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, dude. I'm like, oh, dude, whatever. whatever. Dude. <laughs> that's funny. You were there for literally one night, right? We, oh, and you stayed in an awesome uh, hotel. I did. Yeah, I did not. <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> throw some shade. Uh, Justin's right pissed, now, dude. dude. <laughs> He's still. I was wondering if you're gonna bring it up on I'm, the show. Yeah, right I am. My goddamn wife put me in this fucking shitty hotel. Where'd you stay? Because last time, so the event was like, I had to go for a kids gymnastic tournament and it was at Westgate and so I was like I just I'm not staying here again like this is ridiculous this is a dump you know and it was convenient because it's like you can just walk to the events because dude the way they have these things like structured there's a whole lot of hurry up and wait and you're always late for that first thing, for some reason, they like switch times, and you know, you, you got to like anticipate almost being an hour before whatever they say, and they never give you whatever the the whole itinerary is till like day of, and you're like, what? Where are we going? You know, you just don't know, and so it's like it's kind of like you you need to be there, 
so so you're just there all day. So you're just there. Yeah, it's like judo tournaments oh, when I was a kid. It's brutal. So I get that, and and so the, Courtney's brain is is still revolving around that. And so the closest, I'm like, we need to stay somewhere else because last time the there's one elevator and it was like we couldn't get down. It was hitting every single floor. Everybody was leaving at the same time. And it was like a nightmare for me to sit. And we're just like trying to find the stairs, the stairs, like you couldn't like get access to. And like, so anyways, we, we picked, she picked like the Sahara, which was like down the street. <laughs> and I'm like, this is like sidestepping. Like, this is not nicer at all. Like, this, is, this is a scummy casino. I'm sorry. I'm going to throw shade. It's not that great. <laughs> like, compared to the whole, like, there's all the options of Vegas. Uh, like, I'd rather, like, take an hour cab or something, you know. And, like, now, in Courtney's defense, okay, because I know you can be, you're not the type to complain or speak up sometimes. So right. is this partially your fault because you don't really, because here's the thing. Yeah. I understand this and I, I like, but I've like, I'm, you know me, I'm, I'm the one in the group. You're very vocal about it. Yeah. yeah and yeah, moody yeah. and all yeah. this bullshit. Right. So I've like, I've made it clear. Like you put me in a hotel like this, I'm going to be <laughs> fucking angry all weekend. So, <laughs> so that's like non-negotiable for us, but I've communicated that. So are you yeah. bad about communicating that? And you wait until I would say I'm, um, I'm not great, but I'm, I, <laughs> I would say that like I put up with a lot, but also too I'm clear about like sort of my my lines. Yeah. And so she instead of like going on the like exceed my expectations, like hits right that like very like what I would tolerate. Yeah. Right? <laughs> like just right. Just like there. we have a bathroom. Yeah. yeah. There's yeah. air conditioning. Yeah. And so like the we show up and of course like this the the hotel's uh, elevator wasn't working on the tower we're supposed to stay in so we had to like get a whole another room a different side and uh we get up there and it's literally like uh they're like oh it's an upgrade because of like space you know and so what it is is basically a a, a suite for singles that want to bang you know it's, like, <laughs> it's got this couch it's totally like, like some like couch people are bending people over and like looking out at the <laughs> Town. I'm like, Your this is not for kids it? to sleep on. Like, you're cover, to sleep you're on covering it. with Yeah, we get like covers. a cot. Like there was there's one bed. I'm like, there's one bed in here. Like we, this is gonna work. And so I'm like getting them anyways, dude. It was just funny that ironically we, we run into the same problems anyways. It's like No, I flew in and I, I got to the hotel at 8 30 p.m. and then flew out the next day and I stayed at the Encore. Yeah. <laughs> I was so now, jealous. Did, did was Jerry like, oh, book you, is- or did you book? No, but you know, you know, I book. So Jerry booked. Yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I got a funny story to tell you. I, I was in his nice room sleeping in the bed. I haven't, <laughs> I haven't sold this guy out yet, but could, could, Katrina, because you know, Katrina and Jerry are always ones managing all this stuff of that, and she and she's like. I don't know what you did to Sal, but now he's like you. I'm like, what? It's like, yeah, the last, because he had to fly somewhere like to LA or something like that. And he didn't fly first class. And he was like, hey, why didn't I fly? And there was no, there was no first class with that. And he was talking about the hotel because I guess the, one of the last times they made a mistake. Oh, come they, on, bro. That hotel was terrible. I know. I know. But the, you would. There was no restaurant. They're like in, in the past. Machines. They're like in the past. Machines. Sal would never say anything. <laughs> now he's like, hey, where's my first class? Where's my nice hotel? <laughs> no. Well, it wasn't even that. I just didn't want to stay where I you stayed. Yeah, one time. Yeah. Bro, they had I don't remember where they had me stay uh, in, in LA. I was doing a podcast circuit, but I get to it and I'm like, uh I didn't I can't even walk outside. This doesn't look good. Yeah. What's going on? Yeah, remember when we went to Sacramento to see Mark Bell and we were like, it's the gunshots. <laughs> yeah. What are you doing? That's right. What dude. are we doing right now? Uh, yeah. No way. So how did you how did your boys do then at the tournament? Uh they did great. Uh it was the first tournament of this whole season. So it's this is kind of like the oh my my God, like every weekend's occupied now kind of a deal, but it was the very first competition. And so there was some like kinks to get out and whatnot, but uh, they both had like one really stellar event that they, they crushed and meddled in. Uh, cool. So I was happy to see Bro, They're that. so good. Did you yeah. watch the video he posted? No, I didn't see it. Dude, they're so good. Yeah. I, it's like, I feel like just the other day we were talking on this podcast about him getting them involved in gymnastics. And now they're like, well, they obviously oh, yeah, they have oh. athletic parents plus they're young, you know, so you have all that together. Like kids can, I learn. just didn't think they could pick it up that fast to that yeah. level. Well, I mean, they obviously kinesthetically got some talent, but then you're a kid. It's like, you're just, when you're that age, the neuroplasticity. Do of the they brain, go? So do they go outside and like are on the trampoline and practicing? Like do you? Are they yeah, like yeah. when they're not at practice? Are they doing it also? Yeah, or? and actually, I brought that up with them because that was their weakest event um, because of all the weather we've had here and how 
it, they haven't been outside just like doing their normal thing. Like they, they, I wouldn't even have to like fight them as much about being on uh, their electronics or being inside at all. They would just go out there and like go start jumping and doing their routines on the trampoline. And it was almost like I, you know, that was the one they always crushed. And so that was when they did worse in. And so I'm pretty much attributed it to the fact that they just haven't been out there because the weather doing it. But yeah, so yeah, they've, they've put a lot of work in during the week. They go at least three to four times a week. And leading up to this first competition, they were, I was like, even up in Manteca, they're getting in extra reps and everything, even on the weekend to like prepare for this. So it's cool. Their coach is really like militant, you know, he's like very good about like, he wants to do well and he he's produced some like high level athletes as a result. Really? Yeah. So I'm, I'm still cool. I was going to bring up though, something I noticed kind of sitting there and I love people watching dude. Vegas is like one of my favorite places. Oh, yeah. just the best people place. Watch. Oh, the oh best my place. God. <laughs> it, 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 dude, there's so many stories, but like just in the competition setting, uh, we're sitting there and we're just killing time and kind of watching all these kids do their crazy flips and all this kind of stuff. And, um, you, you notice this sort of, um, interesting. So, so there's teams that it's not just the United States. I guess there's these other teams that are sponsored by some, um, schools here uh from armenia and from russia and so they are able to oh, compete wow. and so you see like oh, so it's an international tournament yeah so they came in and they're all like you know in their their straight up like warm-ups and and you know very like regimented mm -hmm. with the Robotic. way that they walk and this and is and for like, the motherland yes dude <laughs> and like real like you know rigid in the way that they flip and like they they salute and they're just like Bruh! And, and and then you'll see like some other so there's this whole spectrum right like of like super super masculine and super super feminine you know mm -hmm. like within the boys setting and all this and so you'll <laughs> see and it's always in the salute you know at the end like you'll you'll see like yeah or like <laughs> yo <laughs> <laughs> i've never seen anything so you can like okay that the, like the salute different. is what you consider the the landing so it's after they're done, they have to kind of acknowledge that they're done to the judges. And uh, Oh, that's what that is. That's an acknowledgement that you're you're done with the move or whatever yeah. when they do that? Yeah. I never knew what that was called. Did you uh, know that? No, I had no idea. Yeah, so yeah. they salute to him and so and that's uh and it, it varies with like one arm to like I was, is it open for interpretation? Like I you think can, they have they have like regulations of like what specifically they they do with that, but I'm not like I, Again, like I'm just a dad that's sitting there. I don't know all the rules there either. I'm like still learning them. Uh, but yeah, they so they they do all that. Uh, but yeah, man, they run a tight ship. You you should see like just the form of some of these athletes from international, like the Russian team, the Armenian oh, team. Oh, they got a long, especially Russia's like, got. Whoa, yeah. dude, they're killing it. Yeah, who was the coach? Uh, he coached the 94 Atlanta gold medal women's team. Was it Bella Caroli? Is that How his the name hell Doug? do you remember that? No, he. Oh, come on. He's one of the most famous gymnastics coach of all time. He, he coached Nadia Komenich. Do you guys know who she was? No. She was the, the one of the only perfect tens, uh, and she was like 15-year-old girl. And she did a perfect 10 routine. That's he also crazy. coached Louis, uh, Lou, uh, what was her name? That girl, she was on the Wheaties box, the American gymnast. Oh, yeah. What is her? Uh, Retton? What's about. her last name? <clears throat> Doug, you should yeah, know Yeah, I, I know what you, who you're talking about. She was like this, she Zero was like a name. female. Mary Lou Retton? What was Mary Lou Retton. Mary Lou. Yeah, so she was this right. female Mary. gymnast from America in the 80s. Yeah. Who so in in gymnastics is kind of fascinating. I'm not a huge, by the way. So this is just don't lie. Keep going. No, no, no. I, I think it's fascinating. Uh, really I thought it was fascinating for a second. Yeah. And I watched a couple documentaries. That's it. But uh, there's there were either like the small young you know bodies or there were these really powerful strong. Mary Lou Retton was this American gymnast and she was like this little beast and powerful and she got gold medal. She was coached by him as well. And then there was Nadia Comaneci who looks very different. Maybe you could look up Nadia. She got a uh, perfect 10 and she was like this really small. Like, so are you saying these are the only two perfect 10 scores? I don't think uh, Mary Lou Retton got, um, look at her when she was a little kid. She was like this little girl and um, got a perfect 10 in the 1976 Olympics. But uh, Bella Caroli and his wife, I think I'm saying his name, the, he ended up coaching the Americans after the fall of the, or he left the Soviet Union, I want to say, came over here and started coaching our athletes. And then the 94 Olympics, did you guys remember that? Do you guys remember that in Atlanta? I don't. You don't, okay, this is one of the most famous. Vaguely, yeah. This is one of the most famous 
uh, performances of all time. The female, the is it the same year as uh, Nancy Kerrigan? No, that was maybe the next one. No, that might have been the next Olympics, one. So. Yeah, was, that was a Winter Olympic. Yeah, that's that's Bella Caroli right there. You guys don't recognize that guy? Yeah, I do recognize that guy. So yeah. he was like super. T- him and his wife were super tough, but also just super loving. Everybody loved them. Yeah. He he the 94 Olympics. Yeah, didn't he carry her off or something? Bro, yes, you guys you guys now. need to watch the performance of the 94 she Olympics. She hurt herself. The American team was in the running for first place. They were second place. One of our athletes runs out, it does her routine. I don't remember what I think it was the the what's the one with they they bounce off the horse and then they fly in the air. Oh yeah. Pummel horse? No, no. that's that's uh, it's like a double mini, but it's all off the pommel. Yeah, horse. they like springboard and they do the big thing or whatever. Anyway, one yeah. of our girls. I'm not the one with the kids in the gymnastics. <laughs> yeah. They do three events. <laughs> I know the three events. I look at Justin. I'm like, tell me what it is, Justin. <laughs> Come on, bro. A little bit of help here. It's called the jumpy twist. <laughs> <laughs> the jumpy McTwist. Oh, I always look forward to the YouTube comments when we talk about something that we're. We don't like, know anything. Yeah, we don't know. Stay in your wheelhouse. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Heaven forbid we talk about this. Is what, you gotta this is listen. What dads talk about the okay, mo- I, break. This is the first and only time I ever got emotional watching an athletic event ever. If you watch this, I promise you will. Our team is in second place. We need a. I don't remember what a score was that we needed. Our girl goes up. I forgot her name. She was this cute little little voice, little kid or whatever. Hurts her knee. She goes and does it anyway. Lands the landing, sticks it with one leg, puts uh, one leg I up like I this, yes, and dude. bounces on one leg. Okay, puts I, re- I think I remember. And that. we won. I get the so, chills thinking yeah. about it. I remember watching as a kid, and I got, I got like teared up. What yeah. documentary did you watch? Do you remember which one it was? No, it was on Bella Caroli. It was like I don't remember what it was. It was on him. It was on him okay, and his. And there's like criticisms because of the way he coached. I guess he was super hardcore, but his athletes they loved, loved him. him though. Yeah. yeah. Who was the girl that that stuck uh, stuck it uh, that stuck that landing in the '94? I don't remember her name, but it was the it was her one of the was greatest Carrie things Strug. that ever. Carrie Strug. You guys, if you ever see that yeah, shit, I'll have man. to rewatch. I, yeah, these oh. names are. But gymnastics familiar. highly competitive, dude. It's crazy how competitive it, it is. Oh yeah. And you ever seen those those athletes when they stop and they um they retire, they all of a sudden go through puberty. You ever notice that? You ever you ever hear about that? No. So they'll because they train so hard mm-hmm. at that level, they're training for hours and hours and hours a day. And they're tiny; they'll stay small. Mm-hmm. Um, and then they'll stop, and then like a year or two later, they. Their bodies, I guess, are allowed to grow because they stopped training so much, and they look very. So different. it stops them from even going through puberty. If you train your ass off as a kid, like insane, intense, uh, you will delay puberty. You stay lean, you'll delay yeah. uh, puberty for I sure. Didn't, I didn't know that was a th- like. You don't com- have enough body fat it's, on your it's body. Very intensive training. Is it is it common? It well, girls. Well, yeah, maybe, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. No, is that is it common? Is it common with them though? Is it like something? Check it out, Doug. That's I'm, I did not even know that was like. I mean, are you are you sharing like one anomaly story, no, or is this no, like no, no, something? No. Like, I mean, it would, it's common at the highest levels where these kids, <clears throat> who obviously are genetically gifted, obviously are driven because you can't get a kid to train that much unless they absolutely love it and they're driven yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, and they just they, they train eat, so many hours, it, so yeah. crazy, and they're children. They're 13, 14, 15, 16. And I mean, if you're like 19, you're 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 getting old now at that level, mm-hmm. uh, with the, especially with the girls. Wow, competing. interesting. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty wild. So you will see a picture of them, like, you know, they win a gold, and then two years later, like, oh, they they became a mom, and they look like a a woman now or whatever. Yeah. What does that say there? It says uh, gymnastics delays puberty, so growth velocity of the trunk accelerated later in the gymnasts than in control subjects. Uh, despite continuing gymnastic training. You know, you know what's so, stupid about a study like that is that people are going to read that and think gymnastics does that. No. It's not gymnastics. It's the the amount of training that they yeah. do yeah. is is what'll do it. <clears throat> you, I mean, that you could delay puberty with any kind of workout if you just train the shit out of a kid, yeah. you know, for a long time or whatever. You, yeah, you go in excess. Yeah, it's a lot. Wow. Anyway, uh, I'm going to change gears here. We'll talk about tech for a second. What do you guys think of that new... That new VR game, on the oh, PS5. It's, it's you cool. found you found a new horror game, dude. That, that looks interesting. Dude, the tech is going to get crazy with video games. So there's a game on PS5 VR. I don't remember the name of it. Uh, maybe I don't know. Doug could find it or, or Andrew. But you're in VR headset. It's a horror game, so monsters and shit. But it tracks your eyes. Yeah, and the, and the blinking. <laughs> when you blink, 
<clears throat> things will move so that when you open your yeah. eyes again, they're closer or about to kill you, or you'll look to the left and then it's that something will come out the side. It's a horror trick like you watch in a movie where uh, all of a sudden, like you'll see something in the distance and then you kind of like are distracted at something else. And then all of a sudden, now they're like right in the yes. forefront. Yes. Ah! Like they can track that based off of you blinking. What? what Switchback is the name of this. Switchback. So, so there's like a actually, room. This actually tracks your pupil, your your eyes, knows where you're looking, and the game will modify itself based off of where you're looking if you blink. <laughs> wait, wait until you actually so like creepy. fill out like a questionnaire so it like learns about you and then it can start to tailor your fears to it. Like say you have a clown fear or you have like a drowning fear. No, that's I'm serious. Up, dude. That's it's not we're not far from that yeah. happening. Like for yeah, it to be able to exposure therapy. Yeah, yeah. Ima imagine how crazy it's I don't be. even think I think it's going to be even further than that. I think it's going to be able to pick up on <clears throat> your body cues and know what is making you more scared? What's sure. making your heart rate sure. go up? Ma yeah. What's making you sweat more? It just doubles down on that. Yes, like, dude. Oh, man. More, more, more. You know what I mean? It knows how hard to push you. That's going to be crazy. That's a trip. I know. But for it to even know like where you're looking and all of a sudden something pops up, like it's messed yeah, up. Yeah, so the, I watched the trailer on it and there's this like room with mannequins and they look all creepy. And then every time you blink and open your eyes, the mannequins are closer to you. Yeah. And like looking like menacing. Reaching and, at you. Yeah, yeah. So like you imagine kids playing this, like trying to keep their eyes open. <laughs> While they're they take it off, their eyes are all bloodshot. Yeah. Like, I can't sleep. I, tonight, I can't Dad. do this anymore. Yeah. I want to see Adam play that game. Uh, I, you know what's funny? I actually, so I have the Resident Evil for Oculus, um, and I like it, and it scares the shit out of me. So, which is interesting. I don't like a scary movie. Mm -hmm. I don't want to. And I, well, you have like some control. I think of like, maybe uh, that. Maybe also the, the mindset going into it. Right. I, I've talked before about when I watch a movie. It's like I want to. Detach, you want to relax. relax. Yeah. Uh, it's it's very therapeutic for me. And it, when I watch a scary movie, it, I feel anxiety and intense. Yeah. When I when I play a video game, it, it it reminds me of like choosing to get on a roller coaster ride, oh, or like okay. so I'm 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 in for the fact that oh I want to be kind of intense and I want to be stressed out a little bit. So I don't mind the the scary game as much as I do. I thought that was really funny because I, I would have thought I wouldn't have liked. I know. I, you're always talking about that one. Yeah. Game. Was it Resident Evil? Yeah. Oh boy. I mean, I remember the first, the, when I first got the Oculus, that was one of the games I bought because I heard good reviews on it. And it was like, I was, you know, I, Max went down uh, to sleep that night and I like, I went into another room, snuck out of the room and it's like 10 o'clock at night. I'm by myself in my family room and decided to play it. I had to stop because it scared the shit out of me. It was, it, was like, it was just a little eerie. You know what I'm saying? It was late at night. I was all by myself in there yeah, and I was I playing it. To that game i mean they do such a the the graphics on it and the way the the speakers are um you know it has like that kind of surround sound effect so like you'll hear like like it a sounds like it's behind yeah you. there's like a zombie coming you can hear it and it sounds like it's behind you and then you spin around and then here it's coming right towards you and so it's it's pretty wild what wow. they what they can do you but. imagine you put the vr and you're like i don't want to play anymore you take it off you're still in it yeah <laughs> <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Oh, anyway man. i got something for you adam what's that because you know how you have like you always talk about how sensitive your um feelings are no i'm just kidding your sense of smell <laughs> <laughs> yes yes okay i just read a study that shows that people with a more sensitive sense of smell yeah also tend to have better directional skills or have better spatial skills Interesting. Isn't that interesting? Hmm. So I guess the part of the brain that processes smell also is connected to sense of direction. Now, I don't have a bad sense of smell. What about producing and smell? It's, it's just it's stupid, stupid, bro. Anyways. <laughs> so anyway, I thought that was interesting because I know you always... You can smell something before anybody else usually. Yeah, I have. A, I've and I've always attributed that to be my allergies because I'm, I'm so sensitive because of my allergies... That I it also the the positive is that it's I pick up on all kinds of rounds. I don't know if that's a positive thing actually or not. Yeah. I guess if it makes me have better direction. Now, you and I off air have talked about there was a time when I actually you know my my memory my sense of direction was something that I prided myself on. Like I was really good. Like I go somewhere one time I'd know how to get there. Right. Mm -hmm. I've lost that skill over the last few decades with the introduction of navigation. Yeah. Once I started to use that, it became something I became so dependent on that a skill that I once would have bragged about, I no longer had anymore. And so I wonder if naturally I would have had that, continued that on. I bet had. you still would. A, a lot of people <clears throat> lost a lot of skills because we've outsourced uh, to tech. Like, um, like nobody knows phone numbers anymore. It's an easy example. 
I don't know anybody's. I don't know your guys. I talk to you guys all the time. I don't know anybody's phone number I don't know yours. in this room. I know my mom's and dad's phone. Does number. Does that ever that scare you ago. guys? Like, because where we're going with like tech and and the ability sure. for AI and things. I mean, sure, but then don't you think that? I mean, we've already uh, done your that. dad. Your dad probably said that about you, and it's like you've been able to survive just fine. You and, guys know how to start a fire without matches? No. Yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> you. Do. I know, but but okay. So that's were you a boy uh, scout? No, I wasn't a I Boy was, Scout, I but I did a lot of outdoor. Wait, you were a Boy Scout? Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. And they didn't teach you how to do that. I did a one. No, they did. I, yeah. but could forgot. I do it right now? No. They give you a little. They give you the little flint uh, thing. Uh, you didn't, we didn't do. We didn't have to do with a stick. Okay. They they gave you a little. A you little, do it with a stick. I've done it with a stick, and then the rubbing technique, and yeah, all that stuff. <laughs> yeah, where well, you like uh, you carve out, you whittle out um, another stick, and you create that friction when you have to have enough air, so it like is able to then you know heat it up properly, okay. and then you put a little. Well, I mean, um, I, I get, my point is, we just don't, we don't know how to do. Well, a and lot my of stuff and like, my point is, will you ever? So who cares? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess. Yeah. Will there ever be a time in, on, on in this society where you would need to use? Well, you know what skill two sticks to so, start a fire. What's, okay, like, so what <laughs> what skills are we gonna are we gonna lose then? Because I mean, here's what I noticed with uh, this weekend with the teenage kids, is that they lost. They're losing their sense of skill for socialization. Mm -hmm. Like uh, when we were teenagers, if you didn't go out and try to talk to people and try to engage. Um, you didn't do anything. There was nothing to do now because there's so many ways that they could, you know, I guess, entertain themselves, distract themselves or connect without having to talk to somebody. I almost feel like they lost that skill. Like you want to meet a girl. Now you do it through your phone. So that, so when that's we were kids, all we had to approach somebody. So that's all very true. So then the next question is, are we evolving though to a time where that skill is not going to be as necessary? Well, I mean, obviously it's not as necessary because they're still meeting each other. Yeah. They're just not doing it like in that way it is weird though it is weird when you're around a bunch of you know yeah teenage kids and that don't know each other well, and you see how they're like weird about it you're like okay i just i guess i'm always uh, i haven't seen that actually you're saying so you're saying like like so when your kids were with get a bunch of teenage kids together who don't know each other already yeah yeah and then and then just watch how they interact yeah and you'll see it's, it's different it's different yeah, I I don't know. Like I I, I get the the point, and that's kind of like what's always been the point of like uh, you know wherever we're at is, you know you're gonna be you're gonna be a product of whatever like technology is available, and so we're we're gonna be using it. But I I always want to kind of at least be able to balance that with with some knowledge of like if I'm in a crash or if I'm in like yeah. a, you know in a situation where um you know, I'm like I have, like I'm in a dire situation where I need to create shelter. I need to uh, be self-sustainable at least till somebody can come find me or whatever. Like I want to pass it along to my kids so that they know that like if in a situation, if they're in the park or they're like with friends or they decide to go camping or they try to do whatever, like they can at least know that like, okay, this is where you're going to get drinking water and this is where it's safe and this is where you get dysentery, you know, if you if you choose to go in this direction or, well, I mean, you know, yeah. just some basic things that, that they know. But we're more dependent than just knowledge because like <clears throat> we've created systems like food supply, water supply, waste removal that are organized, require, we don't think about this, but they require a lot of work and a lot of organization to maintain. So you could have right now, we're in a city, we're in a big city, right? We live in San Jose, so a million people plus. If let's say there was a sort of solar flare, boom, all power out for a month, everybody could know how to survive, but we'd still lots of death because right. we wouldn't be able to support ourselves because the way we support ourselves are through all these complicated systems. So like what, what a million people are going to hunt in San Jose? What are we going to hunt? Go up in the hills, hunt all the turkeys. Like that'll be gone in two days. <laughs> There's a lot of turkeys, but yeah, yeah, you know what I mean. Uh, it's not gonna so, work. So I mean, I see your point, Adam. It's like this is, that's just evolution, I guess. Yeah, I know. I, I feel like that every generation <clears throat> feels that way about the generation coming up too. I mean, if you go back to your great grandfather, he probably said it about your dad, and your dad now says it about you. You're now saying it about your teenage yeah. boy, and it's like, you yeah, know, like nobody fixes well, their car walking anymore. At some point, will be yeah, dinosaur. You know, the, I mean, that's going to be archaic for for people. Like, why, why aren't you just hovering around? You <laughs> why, 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 why are you leaving your room? Yeah, why are it's you so even, weird? <laughs> just teleport your brain. I well, don't know. That, the, that's the part that I think scares me is that we are normalizing 
something like being plugged into this like VR goggles yeah. and just sitting in your room and and that is considered your socialization. I think that yeah. e- even if that's okay and that it, we end up evolving to that, that's just sad to me. Yeah. It's a slow drip. It's like, is that really what we're made to do? Like, I, I feel like... Uh, I don't know. At some point, like you got to evaluate and assess like with the quality of in the um, the purpose of, of what we're doing. Well, the the I had this That's discussion. That's a much deeper question. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I, I, well, I had a discussion get philosophical. With, with can you Jessica do, can you do our can you do our Paleo Valley commercial first? Actually, then I want to hear what you have to say. Yeah, no, no, I'll get there. Uh, actually, let's, let's go ahead and go there because I'm getting still a ton of emails about the chocolate uh, bone broth protein. Oh, uh, I've actually seen. a lot I did of, not oversell it. I, yeah, I see. A lot I of, actually see tons yeah. of emails where people are like, I thought you oversold it. I tried it definitely the best tasting protein i've ever no, had i've actually seen i've been i've been meaning to tell you that i've seen quite a few people tag uh mind pump in the post of of the, the chocolate bone broth now. Right. it's the best yes. tasting by by far i've never tasted a protein but literally it's a treat like it's not protein it's like, do you think because the bone broth in itself is kind of flavorless and then adding yes, a flavor to it is it's correct like, okay yeah it's fla- if you if you just had pure bone broth it would taste almost like nothing yeah so it's really easy to make taste really good and then because of its texture if you add add it with milk, it'll give you kind of a nice mouthfeel. So mm. that's you know that's got to be part. Of it. Anyway, back to the other co- the conversation. I was talking with with Jessica about this, and you know if you look at the statistics with depression and anxiety, you know like like teen teen girl suicides are like at record levels right now, and I think a lot of it has to do with the kids might just be too safe. And what I mean by that is they don't take any risks. And I would agree with that. And there's a lot of uh, there's a lot kids and adults get out of taking risks, failing, trying, succeeding, mm-hmm. and it's hard and it sucks, but it doesn't suck as bad as doing nothing, right? So like to give an example, if you put yourself out there to get into relationships with people, you're going to get your heart broken. Anybody who's ever had the heart broken knows that that's a terrible feeling, right? Or you could just never get in a relationship and be like, I'm never talking to anybody. I never want to get my heart broken but that's worse. Mm-hmm. So I think that might be part of it. I think part of it is these, that these kids are, they don't put themselves Very out there. risk averse. They don't risk things. They don't do anything that's kind of scary, dangerous, you know, to them yeah. that, that they're just blah. And they're trying to supplement or, or should I say, medicate that with like video games and social media. And it's making them just, just feel empty. Now, how do you <clears throat> personally reconcile that considering that, you probably would be the dad who's nervous about his kid climbing on rocks or doing anything dangerous like that. It doesn't have to be dangerous like in the literal sense, although that too. I mean like like scary like approaching people, going to a party, um, you know, go 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 talk to someone, get go uh, be social. Now, do you Having not think their opinion is controversial? Yeah, yeah, like like that's what I mean. Do, are they know, not, but are, also that too. are they not one of themselves though? I mean, the same the same courage it takes to climb that tree up, you know, fifty feet when you could potentially die. I mean, if anything, that's even more scary. So then, then you going over to talk to a girl for the first time, it's like I'm not going to die. I climbed a tree, uh, you know, that was fifty feet in the well, air, and that didn't kill well, me. Well, what I mean by I that, I should be yes. able to have the courage to go do yeah, this. Right? Yeah, I think that they all contribute. What I mean by that is like not wearing your seatbelt, like or, or drunk driving. I don't necessarily think that that's going to give you like sense of meaning and purpose. I mean, just the scary stuff that they would consider risky and scary that they're deciding not to do. Like you got these boys at home who have video games and pornography, so they don't have the drive to go out and get rejected. No, no. I, what you know I mean, what, I'm what I mean by you reconcile is like other thing. And I'm I'm just asking. Like, do you look back at, because you have teenagers now, and do you wish that? there were areas that you challenged your son and daughter in um, to take more risk that whether it be, and I'm using the physical one because I know yeah. that you tend to be that way more like, cause you are in yeah. yourself that way. So I use that as an example, but it doesn't necessarily, you're right. Have to be that like, do, when you process that and you go like, Oh yeah, that's definitely right. Like, man, I wish, you know, in these situations, I would have made my son do this, or I wish I would have taken the kids to go do that. Like, do you think that? Yeah, I mean, hindsight, there's a lot of things I wish I did. Right, um, right. But the, the the other part of it is, um, like, there was no shortage of, okay, when we were kids, if you guys got grounded, it was stay home. You got to stay at home. And you were like, there's nothing to do here. 
you have a teenage kid now, yeah, getting them to outside. leave the house is hard. Yeah. Where am I going to go, dad? What am I going to do? Who am I going to talk to? My friends are online. Like, where am I going to, I'm like, go to the mall, go walk around. Oh, I don't want to do So it's just weird. It's a, it's, it's like as a parent, you have to manage it all, which then kind of takes away from it. Right. Cause now you're the one making it happen. Not them. Yeah. It's a really weird, uh, interesting time with all that. Like yeah, I was talking to my niece and nephew, the same thing. Like, Hey, you know, where do you guys hang out? You know, with your friends. Oh, we don't really, I don't really see my friends. Like, really? What do you mean you don't see them? Well, we, you know, see each other online, but we really don't go over their house. I'm like, oh, you know? Yeah. And it's like, my son's going to some parties now, which is cool. He's 17, but he's 17. When I, I was doing that when I was, you know, 14, 13, yeah. because there was nothing else to do. He had no other choices. So I don't know, maybe hindsight would have been to, I don't know, not have Wi-Fi. I don't know. Like, how this is, I, this how is where, uh, <clears throat> This is where I think Katrina and I were talking about this. The school that Max is in currently right now, he loves it. I really like it. It's uh, very academically driven. Um, but there's another school who he's we were we really wanted to get him in, and we we couldn't get him in until I think August is when he's going to be able to get in that school. And I'm like, God damn, I'm going to have to transfer my son to three different schools in the short amount of time he's been. And like I, I'm I'm really like nervous about doing that like i don't want to do that to him right yeah. and i know that's my own shit because i bounce around to schools and so that's a bit of myself you know uh in my shit that i have from have childhood you seen the studies on that by the way what kids who change a lot of schools no there's pluses and minuses so i i and i know that right so there's it's weird like i have so i have i get both of them yeah. i have both of those pluses and yeah minuses, like you right? could probably make friends real easily because that's right of, yeah they mm -hmm. say that that, that, that and that that was one of the skill yeah, yeah. when I, when we so that's what when, when people ask me they challenge me to go far enough back like the skills that have made you successful today like yeah. where do they where are they rooted in i definitely attribute something that i actually was fearful of and hated as a kid yeah. right mm -hmm. i hated my parents moving me from a school to school or whatever like that or moving but then when i look back and actually reflect on it i remember why i hated it i hated it because here i am new school nobody knows me nobody's playing with me nobody's talking to me yourself all over again. and so i would i would have to you know go out in uncomfortable situations yeah. and start conversations and you know step in and say hey i want to play or hey and like that forced me to do that while well, doing that enough times built that skill set for me as, as an adult. So yeah, I, I get it. But my point of bringing this one up is the school that I really want him in that he's not in now and it, uh, why I'm str I'm challenged telling Katrina, I was like, ah, oh, maybe we wait a few years and then we move him over there because I really want him in that school and he's loving this school right now and it's so academically driven. And I love what they're teaching him right now. But what this school that he's in right now doesn't have that the other school has is sports. And that's so important to me mm -hmm. for the point you're bringing up right you're now right. because I think that's a big one. That like if you were if you're if you get a kid into sports really early and they like it, they really love the sport. You're boom right there. That's your default yep. right there, right? Like, oh, you got nothing to do, dude. Go grab the basketball, yeah. or I grab it with them. Let's go play. Let's go yeah. throw the ball around. I had so the same conversation with Courtney recently about really? that because it's like, what else are they going to do? And to your point, is like, <clears throat> you know, they're going to be naturally just drawn in, and then you know, tried. To connect with their friends virtually now yep. and like that's a lot easier uh but to to have that structure of like i have to go every day after school i got to do this practice yep. i'm around kids so we're naturally just having conversations interacting and all that it's like it's it's a whole nother educational piece yes. to that process i feel like sp sports of all there's plenty of research to support you know it's funny the benefits of yeah of you know what's funny about what you guys are saying people attribute all the physical benefits to sports as the benefits the physical no. benefits are the smallest very much so that's smallest. the smallest bit of benefit yeah, you get no from hell no yeah. learning to work with others leadership following being able to uh work hard overcome adversity i mean yeah, learning how to lose learning how to win yeah, yeah. i mean god there's so there's so i, I mean do you guys think, and it'd be interesting to see what, what kind of stuff is out there research-wise now, I mean, sports have always been important, and we've, we've seen plenty of studies to support that and research around that. I would argue that it's more important today than it's ever been. I agree. Mm -hmm. Because agree. of what you're saying. Like, man, I, I can only imagine being in your situation where you have, you, you have a very intelligent uh, kids that are like 4-0 students. At, that are really good at their so you can't like default like oh and you need to go do this until you get your grades up they're already doing that hella good so it's kind of like and then they love to play video games or they love to be online like how do you as a dad be like yeah. no that's where their friends are all at right. so the only i think the only weapon you have is hope that 
you did a good job of getting them into these sports so that when those times come and you're like, you know, kick them outside, they, oh, they, they, they go pick up the The other ball. one is getting a job. I think a lot of oh, kids- yeah, are working early. A lot of kids yeah. That would be another one. It's like getting yep. them, teaching them entrepreneurship Forcing skills them. early. You got to get a job. Yeah. Go get a job. Because you, you have to learn how to work with people. You got to learn, like, especially a service industry, go get- So that's, that's one now that I'm looking at. Like, okay, now- Totally. It's I'm going to force a great option. hundred percent. That's okay. actually a, Sal, that's a real, especially for your, your son who's so intelligent. What a cool, and he's not like a hardcore sports kid. That's definitely the route I probably would default to. Oh yeah. No, is like encourage happening. him to build a business right now. Mm-hmm. I would love that actually. No, I'm going to make him fun. go get a job. Go get a job, work at Target or some service <laughs> business and go, go work. And yeah. then you end up having to socialize with people older than you, younger than you. The public, you got to learn how to do service. You got to learn how to all that stuff. Yep. You have a schedule, hundred percent, hundred percent. I think those are the two, the two big way. Because you know, kids don't get jobs anymore either. A lot of kids don't get jobs until that's they're crazy like eighteen. Oh, that's crazy. that's gone down a lot. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh yeah, dude. Now, okay, is you know, that, part of that is, is it skewed a little bit because. Uh, are they not including kids that actually build a little bit of business online? Like, because that's now a popular thing, right? It's popular for a kid to build a social media. Even following. if you include that, the, okay. yeah, kids don't work as much for two reasons. One is a lot more parents are like focused on school, and two, minimum wage keeps going up. The higher minimum wage goes up, the less likely companies are to hire kids. That's a fact, hundred percent fact. You're not going to pay a 15 year old kid twelve bucks an hour. Because you're gonna have a 20-year-old something who's gonna wanna get the job. Right. That's a fact. So every time, by the way, the data's clear on this. Every time they raise minimum wage, the unemployment with teenagers goes down, 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 down. Mm-hmm. So well, that's, that's one of the number one arguments against minimum wage, right? Is yeah. that you it, it you don't you don't allow the free market to compete and and people to to compete to to get the job. Instead, you you automatically cap out a bunch of people. Yeah. Right? That's like you the make, main ar- you make people with bad records, no work history, young people. You screw them out of well, potentially getting a job. I told you guys about the entrepreneur kind of hustle that Ethan's running at his school. Yeah, like yeah. he's already sparked a few competitors uh, now, <laughs> like slinging other products. And, no way, really. Yeah. So like uh, Prime is. So the thing about Prime too, like the drink, the uh, Paul Brothers, yeah. whatever, have like, I guess over in I think it's in the UK. It's like almost like triple the price because it's like it costs so much to like yeah, ship it out or whatever anyway so the perception of it being expensive i think has made it its way back to like the kids of like it's like a commodity and so anyway so this is like a competitive thing to what ethan's doing and then they're all, they're all kind of trying oh, to like get market share and it's just funny to watch uh how this all kind of you know how out. effective how effective those guys are my kids asked me about prime to so my niece and nephew prime like, what do you know about it's that? It's literally just based off of their knowledge of their YouTube channel. It's crazy. Yeah. It um, is they don't crazy. even care about the product. It's just yeah. that it's a, like, it's, it's a cool thing yeah. that, that they want to have. Yeah. We got one more mention with, for Organifi. I do want to say this about Organifi. Their green juice is clutch when I travel. Absolute clutch when I travel. If I yeah. don't have that. I get gut issues every single time. You should hook your son up with Organifi since we get a bunch of free stuff and the margins will be killer for him. Okay? I got I to so. make sure he's a good salesman first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like you sling all the crappy products first and then I'll, I'll hook you up. I'm with you though. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, then, I, hey, hey, and then give him the mind this, this generation, <laughs> This generation exactly. has been targeted with protein so they know the benefits of high protein. Because Remember way back when we used to talk about how like the next, you called this out when we first started the show that you know, protein will be in everything. Remember? Yeah, and then yeah, all of a yeah. sudden protein was in like, so that I feel like the generation now knows that high protein is a good thing. So, you know, selling protein shakes yeah. out competing, you know, and you got great margins since we're, you're getting it for free from dad. I think you could crush out there. Yeah, for <laughs> have, sure. Have for set, sure. We'll start working up. it out on commission. <laughs> so uh, for a shout out today, I was, I don't know what he had posted because he posts so much good stuff anyways, uh, is Dr. Andy Galpin. So if you don't follow him on Instagram. Some of the best research on muscle building and strength. Yeah, he's strength over 100,000 followers now. Finally, he's, I, in my opinion, is, is yeah. deserved. Yeah. He was just on he's a wealth of information. Yeah. Yeah. That, I think that's what really blew him up. I think he, he on Uber, uh, Uberman. <laughs> on Uberman. Uber, Uber, the H is I, silent. Yeah, I think. <laughs> did you listen to that episode. Didn't you listen to that episode? I did, uh, yeah, and he did a few of them. So I'm, I'm, uh, I just listened to the latest one on recovery, and it was fantastic. What's up, everybody? You got to check out the Mobility Wall. Look, if you love using a foam roller, but it's hard to get on the ground, it's hard to get in the right positions, you got to check out the Mobility Wall. It literally goes in your doorway, and then you can do all those awesome foam rolling techniques 
to make yourself feel better, improve ranges of motion, help you get into new positions with your strength training. And it's much easier because you're standing. You're standing and you're using it in the doorway. It's a pretty cool mobility tool. Go check them out. Go to mobilitywall.com forward slash mind pump. Then use the code mind pump at checkout for 20% off your order. All right, here comes the rest of the show. Uh, first question is from bballer11cms. How do I reverse out of excessive daily cardio? I lift six days a week and will continue to do so, but fell into a heavy cardio trap. I want to decrease, but I'm afraid my body will blow up if I don't reverse correctly. Wow. Please help. Oh, good question. Very There's common. a couple different ways that I used to do this, and it depends on the person. The, sometimes I would literally just have them stop. I would just have them cut all cardio out. We would focus on strength training, maybe change the strength training program up. And then what would happen is it would just get stronger, build more muscle. So they didn't gain any body fat. The just excess calories would go to muscle. Then the faster metabolism would offset any cardio calories they were burning before. The second option would be just to cut it slowly. So I'd go from six days a week to three days a week, down to two days a week, down to daily walking type mm -hmm. of deal. And then with that, you'll see, you should see strength gains in your workouts uh, along the ride. You should start to see more of those gains. The, uh, the goal would be to not gain body fat, but rather build muscle uh, through this process. So, so obviously the depends answer is here, like on the, the experience level, the calorie intake, exactly what the programming looks like. But generic good advice I think right here is I take where whatever they were doing cardio becomes walking now mm -hmm. and whatever program they're following, I switch to a, a different modality or like a different adaptation that we're focusing on. So this is why I love the way we've organized like the maps programs. So if somebody said to me like, Oh, I follow something very similar to like maps aesthetic, let's say then I might have them follow a program like map strong, mm -hmm. you know, something that is totally different than the maps aesthetic program and then replace their cardio where they're, you know, running or whatever it is that they're doing for their cardio with walking. Yeah. And then scale back eventually even some of that walking if that's if they're doing that much of it. So that is what it would look like. Yeah. And if you do that, you're not losing that much as far as the calorie burn and hopefully any increase in calories goes to the new adaptation that we're sending. Right. That was sort of the angle I was thinking in terms of like being able to to uh I guess restructure that in terms of making it more active recovery instead of like intensive cardio. Yeah. Um, just because these people are busy bodies and they need like constantly something to engage that, that need. Uh, and to, to do that, you can actually uh, create a very good uh, situation where you are um, weight training and, and you're going to want to put the importance on the weight training part you know, to your earlier point and, and kind of refocus it on that. But the days in between, especially in, in the off time to have a more restorative uh, activity scheduled with that, I think will pair nicely with somebody that's very cardio focused. Yeah. So I'm going to say, I'm going to tiptoe with what I'm about to say, because this isn't going to happen to everybody, but I've seen this happen enough times where it, def it does happen where somebody's doing way too much to, they're just cumulative stress, cumulative yeah. workouts, yeah. lots of cardio. Yep. I have them cut the cardio out and they get leaner. Yep. They actually got leaner. I know that sounds like it doesn't make any sense. How is that possible when they're, they were burning so many extra calories with the cardio? I think it was because their body was recovering. And, and oftentimes it wasn't weight they lost, it was body fat. Yes. So mm -hmm. they would end up building muscle and losing body fat at the same time. This tended to happen more often with my female clients who overdid everything. Mm -hmm. Uh, I remember the first time this happened, I had this aerobics instructor that worked for me in one of my gyms. She was lifting weights, plus teaching classes, plus doing all this cardio. And we had her cut out the cardio, um, add a little yoga, and we were prepared for fat gain. She just got leaner. And she did nothing. She didn't change any, her diet or anything. It was just that. So that can actually happen when you're sending, when the signal you're sending is to build muscle more than it is to just, you know. I, I would add stamina. to that. Yep. And th I... I don't know this person's exact routine, but I would I would guess it probably looks more like a bodybuilder split, you know, failure type training routine if they're already kind of this yeah. intensity junkie and maps anabolic. So yep. get rid of the cardio, replace it with walking, change your programming to maps anabolic three days a week, full body, 
your all, your other two days, trigger sessions, and watch what happens. Yeah. I bet you this person would see great results. Now, what's interesting is I wonder if this person even does strength training because the question doesn't say that at all. It's just, oh, no, they did. Oh, they said they're, I lift six days a week. Yeah, they're lifting six days a week plus that, cardio. Yeah, wow. you're right. Yeah, I'd go maps anabolic and walk. Yep. And you I would, think I think your your earlier speculation of them just like cutting volume yep. like would do wonders. Yep. Just cut the cardio. That's insane. Yeah. Yep, yep. Well, that's why I would switch it. I mean, walking's not walking's gonna be good for them. And yeah, there's six days a week of weight training down to three days. Yep. Yeah. Low body. Oh, watch. Much better situation. Watch. Yep. But again, you know what's gonna be the hardest? The mental part. Hundred percent. You, if you are, you're used to doing all that sweating, all that cardio. Yeah, it's gonna freak you out. Um, to think they're gonna blow up, it's it, probably the opposite will happen. Yeah, and keep, I, and keep I the wouldn't same even. Diet. I exactly. I wouldn't even adjust the diet. No, eat the same way and just switch out all those. Switch out. It's everything all about said. people understand this. It's all about the signal that you send your body. And burning calories manually works for a very short period of time. After that, your body adapts. It learns how to burn less calories over the rest of the day to offset the calories you're burning while you're doing this workout. This is, and they've done studies on this. It's very interesting. And I'm, I'm not saying there's no health benefits to doing lots of activity. We're talking purely from a fat loss uh, and body composition perspective here. But if you send the right signal and your body wants to build muscle and it's trying to get stronger and you're not burning those extra you know, calories, your body just learns how to have a faster metabolism. It actually builds more muscle. So very interesting, but I've seen it happen many times. Next question is from Catherine Health Journey. If I'm severely struggling to complete a lift due to feeling out of breath, like when performing a Bulgarian split squat, is that a sign I need to start doing more cardio? You can. You could do more cardio. Um, I like to do more, I guess, what you would label as what? Conditioning type work. So like for me, hit cardio de definitely would take care of this or pushing the sled would definitely take care of this. Or, okay, here's the easy one. You just keep practicing the split stand squat and just keep pushing it and you'll get more stamina in that particular exercise. But cardio will help with that as well. Yeah. I mean, that 12 minutes of hit, I think is the perfect prescription yeah. for this specific thing. I think that uh, you're going to get what you need from that. Like a, a set of Bulgarian uh, squats, um, even if you're doing 12 to 15 reps on each side, which is a lot for that, uh, is not going to take you longer than a couple of minutes. So if you build enough cardio endurance to withstand a 12 minute hit cardio session, you're going to be able to do the Bulgarian split squat. So I think that, and I, I do like this as an indicator that, Hey, I need Cause typically yeah. when I'm, I'm more concerned about body composition, cardio is always on the kind of the back burner of my mind mm -hmm. until I see it affect my weight training. Once I see it, I was just doing cardio the other day. First time I made a big joke about it on my story and stuff like that. But that's kind of the signal for me is like, Oh, I found myself a little winded doing something that I should be able to accomplish. Like, let me work on my cardio endurance a little bit. Yeah. I found the same, uh, when I was working out is like, you just find that it, you're struggling a bit more. I didn't know if it was my central nervous system. I didn't know if I was lacking strength, but for me, it was just the fatigue of it. And, and to get back into doing things, uh, with more cardiovascular output, uh, really did help to then contribute towards, you know, better performance in my workout. So it is something that I do pay attention to and, and know that I, every now and then I got to cycle that in. Otherwise I'm not going to reap the benefit. Yeah. Two, two, here's a couple things that are great for the kind of stamina that I think this person's talking about. Um, one is you could do like giant sets where you do, uh, like three exercises back to back. Some people call that a circuit. Um, you can call it a circuit. I, I, I call, call it a giant it, set. Call it a tricep. Or a tricep. Cut your um, rest in between. Yeah, no rest in between. So you do like one exercise to another exercise to another exercise. And there's a different ways to pair them. We've done other episodes talking about that. It's not just random exercises. There's programming uh, that goes with it. Um, so that's more of a like bodybuilding way. Um, the other thing, and a lot of people don't talk a lot about this, but you jump rope. Jumping rope Ugh. for 60 seconds. Like if you've never done it before, do 60 seconds of continual uh, rope jumping like that builds some tremendous stamina. I mean, ten minutes of jumping rope is like, boy, that's it's like an a, it's hour a lifetime. Oh dude. yeah, that's it's really really tough. And it's uh, I'll say start slow because it will your your feet and your calves and your Achilles will get sore. But you know, rope jumping is a is a great form of of, of building stamina. A great way to build stamina. Next question is from Guy Pettigrew. What's the best way to incorporate isometrics as a form of trigger sessions to enhance mind muscle connection? Uh, isometrics mm. are, you know, I love seeing that more and more people are talking about them. Uh, yeah. Because when we started the podcast, nobody talked about isometrics. Justin would would bring it up. Yeah. 
Nobody talked about talking them. to a wall. Yes. <laughs> And then that got me interested and I would start reading the research back then. And I remember, you know, seeing all the research and it, it sparked my interest as well. So it's pretty phenomenal. I like isometrics, uh, in, in to movement based, not necessarily <clears throat> muscle based. Um, you can use a stick or a PVC pipe for some of the stuff, but you get into a position, you hold that position and you drive the stick into the wall or into the floor or up into, uh, the cage and hold the position. It's quite intense. Um, it's a bit exhausting. We have some YouTube videos on some of these, uh, some some movements. I think we have a YouTube video on the Dumphy squat, if yeah, I'm not we mistaken, uh -huh. and maybe a couple of more that we can link to this. Um, that's the way I like to do it. Bodybuilders of the past would just pose and flex, which is not a joke either. Like uh, for anybody who's ever competed in bodybuilding and knows getting on stage posing, it looks like they're not doing anything. You try to pose and flex every muscle at the same yeah. time and hold that position for 30 seconds. And that's that's a form of isometric. Well, and also too, I think that uh, you could hold the most uh, difficult portion of the exercise, like say the very bottom of your push up, and just yeah. hold that, you know, for an extended amount of time and, and focus on that or like a pull up or a chin up and really kind of focus on, you know, the most difficult portion of that rep. And it, I think calisthenics work uh, type exercises work very well for this. And, and, and to be able to hold it in the, in the uh, position uh, that you struggle the most. Uh, I think that's an, another way to kind of approach it besides, you know, using a tool or something to kind of drive that. Yeah. I'm assuming this person is asking because they want to build more muscle. Mm. That's probably the main goal, but I'm with you, Sal. If, if I got somebody who wants to incorporate isometrics and it's on trigger days or their off days of training, I would prefer my client, uh, focus more on like mobility stuff. So like prime pro would be a good example. The webinar that I did on this where you do a 90 nineties and, and isometric moves that are going to benefit your overall movement. And the reason why, and I know at first you may not think, Oh, I, I, you know, I want more of the pump. I want more of the muscle. I want to build more muscle. But if you work on these limiting factors, uh, like with your squat or your like combat stretch for ankle mobility, like let's say you just, you, you can't break 90 because you're, you're limited because of your range of motion in your ankles. Well, you doing isometrics uh, for like combat stretch and doing that on your off days is going to benefit the depth of your squat. That new found range of motion on your squat is going to benefit you muscle building. Yes, wise. totally. So if my client was asking- or, I bet more people will get more benefit from doing what you're saying than any other form. That, so, yeah. And I, I, I believe so too. So- if so, if a client asked me this for that reason, I would still push them in the direction of okay, well, let's address good call. Um, you know, your your range of motion that you lack in your shoulders or your scapula or let's your ankles or your hips, and let's do those isometric holds that we have in Prime Pro to address those things. Because if I can get a greater range of motion out of your shoulders, a greater range of motion out of your squat, like those things will end up adding more muscle and and also benefits you as far as like the way you feel too. Like you're like, if you had any chronic pain potentially bothering you, or you just want to prevent chronic pain for, from happening in the future, like that, I think is a, a better choice of, of utilizing it on as a trigger session. Next question is from a glimpse of me is semaglutide a good tool. If you're struggling to lose fat, the recent discussion on episode 2014 made it sound like it was I thought using pharma medications was not a good thing. Okay, so let's be really clear here. First off, uh, nothing will come close to replacing um, your changing your lifestyle. Diet, how you exercise, sleep, stress, like those are going to make the biggest impact on fat loss. Plus, there are benefits that go above and beyond just fat loss, like the psychological benefits, the the overall health benefits. Um, it, there's just nothing comes close. Now, semaglutide is a peptide. It's I think it's a GLP-1 agonist. It's like this class of peptides that uh, have been researched for diabetes or to improve um, insulin sensitivity. And studies show that they quite effectively induce weight loss. Um, it, now, in comparison to like the weight loss drugs of the past, semaglutide and other GLP-1 receptor agonists, like they blow them out of the water because the old medications for weight loss were stimulants and they had all these terrible side effects and stuff like that. Um, so these are just better. They're much better, but 
this is not this is not like someone says I'm struggling to lose fat. Well, let me look at your diet. Let me look at your training. Let me look at your lifestyle. Let me look at your sleep because I guarantee you, you won't struggle with fat loss if I can look at those things and adjust them in appropriate ways and adjust the way that you live your life. Um, if you don't adjust anything and then you take something like semaglutide to lose weight, you'll you'll lose some weight, but you're not going to get the same kind of benefits. And it's not like you're going to lose all the body fat. Okay. And then there's also some some detriments. The most of the way, some of the way that it causes weight loss is by increasing, uh, I guess you could say insulin sensitivity, um, okay, loosely, but a lot of it's just from appetite suppression. So what do they find in the studies with semaglutide? Well, when people who don't work out and don't change their diet, take semaglutide, they lose weight, but they also lose muscle mm. because they eat less. They're not feeding them their gains. Yeah. So it's not like you just take it and you get these like great result. Even though semaglutide is muscle sparing, it has muscle sparing effects. If you don't eat enough protein and you're not sending a signal to build muscle and you just eat less, your body will try to a a accommodate and adapt by reducing muscle mass because what it's trying to do is it's trying to slow your metabolism down to match the new calories that you're taking in. Hmm. So if you take semaglutide, you got to make sure you get adequate protein intake and you got to make sure you lift weights. Otherwise, yeah, you'll lose weight, but you'll lose muscle along with it, in which case, like, who cares, right? Who cares if you, lo you lost weight that way? You know, this is an area that I always feel really challenged with this business and that, you know, one of the core values that we have is, is radical honesty, right? So I'm a big believer in sharing with our audience if there's stuff that we use, like I use, I've been using hormone therapy for a very long time. So uh, disclosing that and sharing that with our audience, I, I think is important uh, to keep it uh, transparent. Uh, the fact that we, all of us are extremely interested in peptides and experimenting and, and using them ourselves right now. Uh, we're going to be honest about that. Uh, there's supplements that we've partnered with that we use that we love. Uh, but at the same time too, all those things do not come before uh working on your relationship with food, with exercise, uh, your body image. Like there's so many things that I, I think that we, we built this, uh, this business with the intent of helping people in that direction. And for the most part, I think we've done a, a pretty good job. And then we've come to this, this place where it's like, okay, well, there's other things that we the all novelty bucket. There, there's other things that we, we utilize or we like, or that we think we're interested in, but it's like, I don't ever want to come across as like, this is the answer for people. And I wouldn't recommend it to most of my clients until we get those other big rocks handled. And then it's like, okay, like you, you've checked all these boxes and you're curious about this peptide. I'm telling you openly that I'm using it and trying it. Like, mm -hmm. why not? Then I'm, then I'm not against it, but I always want to be careful that we don't come off like we're, pitching or right. selling. And I think the whole time we've been partnered up with supplement companies, I think we've always presented this like whole foods is always the first and foremost, but that doesn't mean that I don't grab a beef jerky stick yeah. every once in a while or grab a protein bar because I'm on the go. And this or, isn't even a moral thing. It's just, it just, just doesn't come close to comparing that. Well, that's yeah. what I'm saying yeah. is we know that those things aren't going to even come close to the, 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 the things that really matter when it comes to the results. And so it's first check those boxes you spend most of your time, your effort, your money. It's like arguing over it's the new science. Like we don't know all of the details. Uh, it hasn't been around for that long yet. And we're still sifting through all of that. So it's exciting in terms of like what they're coming up with and the science surrounding it with peptides and you know, how they're able to kind of like really target these parts of the body and their functions. But uh, in terms of like what we, we always want to lean on is the, the foundational blocks of how to get there. Yeah. Look, okay. Even the ones that have a lot of science behind them and studies and stuff, look, here's the deal. It's like arguing over the air filter on a performance car. <laughs> and, and we haven't even talked about like the engine. Okay. Like the, like the engine of the car makes a big difference. Air filter will make a little bit of a difference, but it's not going to come close uh, to the engine. What the engine's going to do. Look, even testosterone, Testosterone, of all the peptides and hormones and whatever that you could you could use and take, testosterone by far is the most powerful muscle builder. Nothing comes close. Growth hormone doesn't come close. No other hormones come close. No peptides or combination of peptides come close to testosterone. If you give a man with low testosterone, not even talking about a normal testosterone man, a man with low testosterone who needs to take testosterone, you give him testosterone and he doesn't lift weights, he'll gain like yeah. five pounds of lean body mass. That's it. 
Could I get him to gain more than five pounds of lean body mass just through proper strength training and diet with low testosterone? Yes, I could. Just to give you an example, right? Now, what happens when you are working out and you pay attention to your exercise and it's consistent and you got a good diet uh, and you're, you're paying attention to that and you you sleep, you, you look at your sleep and your stress. So you lead a healthy lifestyle that's a priority to you. And then you, you, you utilize these things to optimize hormones, you utilize peptides. Then it can be really fun. It can be really fun to see kind of what the next level looks like for you. But besides, you know, if you're not doing those things, like you're wasting your time and it's expensive. I'm going to be honest with you. Semaglutide is a, is a GLP-1 yeah. receptor. It's the most popular one. Yeah, what does Agonist? that run? What does that it's run? It's going to cost like a thousand bucks a month. Is it up to, is, that's growth hormone so, price. No, no, yeah, something like that. So, I mean, it's going to be expensive. The other, other peptides are a lot less and there's other peptides. There's like a whole bunch of peptides. Some of them are a lot less expensive. But it's like, okay, so let's say you spend, you know, 500 bucks a month on uh, peptides to help yourself out, um, but you're not working out properly. You've got crappy workout programming or you're inconsistent. Your diet sucks. Or what are you going to notice? Eh, a little bit. You might get a little more energy. You might feel a little better. Where I could take you and do one thing. I could look at your sleep, fix your sleep, and you'll, it'll be like life-changing. Or you could have low vitamin D supplement with vitamin D. You could go buy it at CVS for $5 and it'll be life-changing, right? So we got to put these things in context. Mm. That being said, if you're somebody that's, um, you know, interested in this kind of stuff and you've, you're checking the boxes and you're going to do be, you know, making sure that you work out consistently, your diet, all that stuff. Then hell yes. Then you, then you do this kind of stuff yeah. and it'd be a lot of fun yeah. and, and it could be quite interesting what you could accomplish. I mean, my, look, I've, I keep everything pretty consistent so for me, it's been really fun because I know when something's doing something when it's not because everything else is good. I, I keep everything in check. I'm very consistent. Um, so I know if I add this, wow, I notice you know, my lifts went up by 10 pounds or I gained four pounds of lean body mass or you know, I, 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 you know, my sleep is a little better. Like with testosterone for me, testosterone and peptides for me, now I went from low. When, when I got tested, it was really low. My, my total test was 230 something, which is even below, like a general practitioner would have put me on testosterone. That's how low that was. When I went on testosterone and peptides, for me, it turned into about 13, 14 pounds of lean body mass with everything else that I was doing. That's a lot, but I work out consistently. I eat, you know, I focus on, you know, my sleep. I do all the things, right? And, you know, so that's, that's a pretty significant difference, but it's not like, it's not going to take someone from, you know, out of shape to Mr. Olympia or anything like that. So just to keep things in context, I yeah. think it's important. No, I, I agree. And if you're, if you're interested in something like this, go through a doctor because you can go online and there's a gray market of these research uh, chemicals, they'll call them. And you don't know, we interviewed a, a doctor on this, uh, a, a, an expert, and he said, it's not that they don't have all of the, you know, it's not that they'll give you 50% of the dose. That's not what you need to worry about. It's that they have all these broken peptides in there that we don't know how they're affecting your body, which is kind of scary. Mm -hmm. So go through a doctor, go through a pharmacy that has to follow regulations and get checked and, and, and stuff like that. And if you want to talk to a doctor, go to mphormones.com. We have good ones that we connected with. Look, if you like the show, head over to mindpumpfree.com. Check out some of our guides. We have free guides that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at mindpumpjustin. Adam is on Instagram at mindpumpadam. And you can find me on Twitter at mindpumpsal. Today, we're going to teach you everything you need to know to build a strong, well-developed chest. When I think of you know, weak points and, and areas that I struggled with developing for a, a really long time, chest was up there with the- Yeah, it was for me. It was for me for sure. I got more caught up in the weight I could lift versus how I was developing my body. I think it's one of the most challenging muscles to develop for most people because the form and technique. 